In 1981, director Joe Dante's The Howling came out, a movie which took a modern take on the werewolf subgenre, while also giving it a tongue-in-cheek feel. Being released in the same year as An American Werewolf in London, thanks to these two movies, the world of werewolves was never going to be quite the same again, as the fierce lightenthropes were back and here to stay. The Howling tells the story of Karen White, played by the mum from E.T., who is suffering post-traumatic stress after an undercover encounter with a deranged serial killer, Eddie Quest. So to try and put the traumatic events behind her, her and her husband visit a psychiatric therapy retreat. But things are not quite as they seem, as this is a retreat of werewolves. And the only thing that can stop them are silver bullets in this memorable werewolf movie that had one of the most truly memorable endings to any werewolf movie ever. A transformation on live TV. So today we are going to sink our teeth into the howling by looking into 10 things that you may not know about the howling. So let's keep the silver bullets handy and check it out. Number 10, based on a more serious book. Despite the fact that the movie had a tongue-in-cheek feel about it, the book it was based on was actually very serious. The Howling novel was published in 1977 and was written by Gary Brander. Early scripts of the movie were more in line with the book, but director Joe Dante felt that the script needed some work. When scriptwriter John Sayles was brought on board to rework the script, he wanted the movie to feel more self-aware, with an almost comical feel, similar to that of his and Joe Dante's previous efforts with Piranha. By the time the rewrites were done, it actually bared little resemblance to the original book. In fact, the book is so dark, it's insane. Instead of a woman struggling with post-traumatic stress over a near encounter, working as an undercover journalist, in the book, the main protagonist is a middle-class housewife who suffers a rape in her home, which then leads to a miscarriage and nervous breakdown. Yeah, whew, that's pretty dark. Number nine, The Howling boosted Joe Dante's career. Despite the fact that the movie was a moderate success, it still caught the attention in all the right places, which of course led to Warner Brothers hiring Dante for Gremlins, as he more than demonstrated a natural blend of horror and comedy. There is actually a reference to Howling in Gremlins, in which Dante put a smiley face sticker on the fridge, which is a reference to the Howling serial killer, Eddie Quest, whose trademark is a smiley face. Number eight. Rick Baker left the movie to work on another werewolf movie. Ever notice how the effects in The Howling look very similar to that of An American Werewolf in London, but just aren't quite the same? That's because An American Werewolf in London's makeup artist, Rick Baker, was originally attached to The Howling to which he had started to work on, but then left with his effects incomplete when asked by John Landis to work on his movie instead, which led Baker to go on that project, taking his wizardry with him. So effects artist Rob Botton was brought on board to finish what Baker had started, and to be honest, he actually does a pretty good job, and the effects are eye-catching enough, even if the werewolf does look like the most happiest werewolf ever. Still, why can't werewolves be happy? Number seven, The Howling versus Elvis? Nope, you haven't gone to Lally or just wandered into a weird parallel dimension. This did happen. The Howling was released on April the 10th, 1981, the same day as a documentary based on the king of rock and roll called This Is Elvis. Yep, that's right, on April the 10th, movie lovers got to bear witness to werewolves going head-to-head -head with Elvis himself. 
Also released that day was the British fantasy movie Excalibur, Knight Rider, the George A. Romero movie about medieval knights on motorbikes, along with Going Ape, the movie where Tony Danza must take care of a heap of orangutans. So technically, this day was a cinematic beatdown of werewolves versus Elvis versus King Arthur versus knights riding motorbikes versus a heap of cheeky orangutans. Man, that's just weird. Number six, the sequels. The Howling was so successful, it got about a hundred sequels, most of which would be straight to video releases. First up, there was The Howling 2, released in 1985, which had the memorable title of Sturbia Werewolf Bitch, also known as Your Sister is a Werewolf. The movie features Christopher Lee, in which, in one scene, we even see him go to an 80s disco, along with Sybil Danning's impressive jugs. The movie definitely feels like a downgrade in quality and storytelling when compared to the first one, and it was absolutely loathed and hated by fans of the original, and still, even to this day. So much so that when Christopher Lee worked on Gremlins 2, he apologised to the director for starring in the awful sequel to his movie. Then there's The Howling 3, The Marsupials, released in 1987. Although this film is bad, it definitely piques my interest, as this time the action takes place in Australia, complete with oddball Australian humour, in which the story actually has nothing to do with the other two movies, and has werewolf nuns in it. Yeah, werewolf nuns. Also, this film is probably the only movie in human history to feature were-kangaroos. Oh yeah, we've got were-kangaroos thrown into the mix now. Because, you know, Australia! Following that, there was The Howling 4, the original Nightmare, released in 1988. The Howling 5, Rebirth, in 1989. The Howling 6, The Freaks, in 1991. Howling at New Moon, in 1995. And more recently, Howling Rebirth in 2011. I tried watching this one, but it honestly felt like a Twilight clone, and was just so messy, muddled, and disinteresting, and poorly acted. I just couldn't get through it all. Yeah guys, just stick with the original on this one. Number 5. The Howling was composed by a cinematic legend. The score was provided by Pino Donagigo, who no doubt was brought on board to compose the movie's score because he scored Joe Dante's previous movie, Piranha. But Donagigo has actually had a very impressive career of scoring many memorable movies, often working with movie directing icon Brian De Palma. Some of his musical contributions include scoring hits like Don't Look Now, Carrie, Dress to Kill, Body Double, Raising Cain, and even the seed of Chucky. Yeah, he's gone from howling to Chucky. And he is still scoring movies even to this day. Number four, it was a quick shoot. The howling was just filmed in 28 days, which by the way also includes reshoots, which is just an amazingly quick time for a special effects heavy movie about werewolves. Because of the schedule and budgetary constraints, some shortcuts had to be made. For example, the famous transformation scene was filmed in Joe Dante's office. The scene where Karen White is in a porno store was a real, actual porno store. And during the filming of the scene, Dee Wallace was extremely uncomfortable. Yeah, she wasn't acting in those scenes, she generally didn't want to be in there. There is even one bizarre effect when we see cartoon animations doubling for werewolves, which has been put down to budgetary restraints. So it's quite a miracle that the final film had such a polished look about it, considering all the compromises and setbacks made. Number three, the real life relationship of Dee Wallace and Christopher Stone. The characters of Karen and Bill may have been a couple on screen for The Howling, but the actors who played them were actually engaged in real life when the movie was filmed. Yikes, that would have been awkward, what with the raunchy sex scene Stone does with Elizabeth Brooks. And keep in mind, that scene was pretty steamy too. 
So if Wallace's and Stone's relationship can survive that, then it can survive anything. Well, maybe not. The couple ended up getting a divorce in 1995. However, one thing I will add is that both Wallace and Stone start together in another canine monster movie, which of course was Stephen King's Cujo. This time, Stone was a character that Wallace's character was cheating on her husband with. Well, gee whiz, no wonder they ended up getting divorced. They kept working with directors who were making them play infidelity roles. That and the constant ferocious dog beast probably took its toll on the marriage too. Number two, the Night Skies Connection. In The Howling, there is a scene where the Illy Kenton character talks about UFOs in the skies and cattle mutilation. Well, according to our good friends at IMDb, the scriptwriter John Sayles may have added that into the script as a nod to a movie script he was currently working for for Steven Spielberg called Night Skies, which was to be an alien horror movie which featured UFOs and cattle mutilation. However, Night Skies didn't end up happening. The movie eventually evolved into Poltergeist, where instead of aliens, the horror now revolved around ghosts. And the Night Skies project would also get referenced in Gremlins, as we see it's being shown in that movie's local cinema. Number one, The Howling nearly had a different director. Before Joe Dante landed himself the job of directing duties, proving to the world that he's a more than competent filmmaker, director Jack Conrad was originally going to direct. Conrad had previously directed Country Blue and Once Upon a Girl, both of which I have never heard of. So maybe The Howling was going to be his big break, but sadly it never happened, as Conrad just couldn't see eye to eye with the studio, and the creative differences were too much, to which he was removed as the movie's director. However, he is still listed as the movie's producer. The thing is, Joe Dante gave The Howling his magical distinct touch, and it's just hard to imagine the movie any other way. But regardless, we could have ended up with a Howling movie totally different to the one that we all know and love. Well, ladies and gentlemen and werewolves, that was my look into the Howling. The fact that werewolves are still big in the entertainment world is thanks to movies like The Howling and An American Werewolf in London, as those movies took a tired old genre and made it interesting again, and gave it a modern spin, which is what has enabled the werewolf mythos to evolve. Anyway, I'm Minty, and not once did I mention in this episode that my main man, Dick Miller, is in this movie. How weird. How could I leave him out? See ya.